Hi, welcome to the lecture series. My name is Fong Yi Liu and I'm an F1 in Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Woolwich. I worked in acute medicine, geriatrics and I'm currently on respiratory. This lecture is the first of a series that will be uploaded once a week until August. The first six lectures of the series will be on COVID and the next four in the series will focus on the role of F1 in various shifts and jobs. The last two will be targeted for those who will be entering final years and sitting the SJT exam in December. The experience from working in a hospital that was hit hardly by COVID inspired me to do this series of lectures. I'm sure you've heard various myths and conspiracy in the media about COVID. Indeed, it's a very new disease and there's still a lot to be learnt about it. So this lecture series aims to help you understand COVID and be able to diagnose and manage patients with COVID once you're in placements or as an F1. Managing COVID patients will also give you lots of fascinating stories to tell. Like, once upon a time, the whole ward was on 15 litres non rebreath and then the ward ran out of oxygen and we moved the whole ward. Or there, there are so many ITU referrals that they're doing regular ward rounds in the ward. It's, it's truly an experience. So in this lecture, I will cover the epidemiology, virology, transmission, symptoms, risk factors, and I'll also briefly touch on diagnosis, management, complication and prevention, but these will be covered in further details by my other colleagues in future lectures. The diagram on the left showed the timeline of events and number of cases in China in the beginning of COVID. It was first reported by China to the WHO in December 2019 as the clusters of pneumonia caused by an unknown pathogen. The cases of COVID increased exponentially and resulted in local lockdown in China. It very quickly spread around the world and the first two cases in UK was reported on the 31st of January. It continued to spread in the UK and especially in London with a peak of daily deaths at 1,172 on the 21st of April. The graphs on the top show the total number of cases versus time on the left and the total number of deaths versus time on the right. The graphs below show the daily number of cases and daily number of deaths respectively. At the time of this lecture, the daily COVID deaths was 357, so it seemed that we're over the first peak. The total COVID-associated UK deaths was more than 40,000. Total number of lab-confirmed cases was more than 280,000. London was one of the worst affected cities with cumulative COVID cases of more than 27,000 and deaths of 6,000. We are also expecting a second peak probably in around July-August time. And there is also speculation that when we enter winter this year, there will be yet another peak. This is very unfortunately for some of my colleagues that are planning to take an F3 or is taking an F3 currently because they won't be able to travel and because lots of people are staying in the UK the locum jobs that used to be widely available now become extremely competitive so next year will be probably a year of a lot of unemployed doctors Sorry about the storm outside. UK is ranked fourth in the world in total number of confirmed COVID and second in the number of global deaths. Why is UK doing so poorly? I think partly it's because there is such a divided opinion in the beginning of COVID. There are a lot of speculations that UK will not be affected by COVID because UK is a much cooler country, so the virus will not do well in such climate. 
There are also a lot of people that believe COVID is no different to a flu. So in the beginning of COVID, it wasn't taken seriously. There were no clear guidance about、uh, PPE or the flow of patients in hospital or how to divide them up. So there was a period of time where we were not wearing the right PPE when taking care of patients that probably had COVID. The number of COVID cases continued to increase, and eventually, COVID dec- was declared a pandemic in March. And then everything changed. Doctors were redeployed into a master COVID rotor in the hospital, so we have like、um, consultants. Uh, rheumatologists covering acute medicine. It was a fun time. At the peak of COVID, we only had a very few wards that didn't have any COVID patients, and everyone was on oxygen. I remember on one night shift during the peak, between me and the other F one, we certified fifteen deaths, and usually we would have one or none at all. There were so many deaths. In such a short period of time, that mortuary didn't have enough slots for bodies, so they had truck outside of the hospital to accommodate the bodies. I think you now know how bad the COVID was, and all are very interested to learn more about COVID. So let's talk about the virus.、Um, coronavirus disease nineteen is caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus.、Uh, It's it's also called the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus two. The virus is a sixty to one hundred and forty nanometer round or oval polymorphic Lenach B beta coronavirus. It is genetically quite distinct from other well known coronavirus that I am sure you've heard of, the MERS in twenty twelve and SARS in two thousand and two. But similar to other coronaviruses. Um, SARS-CoV-2 has four structural proteins: spike S, envelope E, membrane M, and nucleocapsid N proteins. N protein contain the virus RNA, which are detected in swab test. The S protein is responsible for allowing the virus to attach itself to cells ACE2 receptor, which is the proposed mechanism of entry. And it is now well known that the virus can also cause cytokine storm and uncontrolled inflammation that caused multi-organ damage, which lead to death in a lot of、uh, people with COVID. In terms of transmission, it's a person-to-person transmission by respiratory droplets. This can be direct or indirect. Direct is by breathing in the droplets that. Expelled by another person, for example, through coughing. Indirect is through contacting some of these droplets down to your mucosal membranes, namely your eyes, nose, or mouth. So a lot of people are aware that they need to stay two meters apart for social distancing, and that's because droplets typically travel up to two meters. However, people may not be aware that viruses can actually live on and stay infectious on surfaces for up to five days. So that's why we need to wash our hands all the time. We also know that the virus can survive a temperature from zero、uh, to up to twenty-seven degrees. So the current climate in England is actually ideal for the spread of the virus. Other than droplets, the the viral RNA has been detected in stools, bloods, ocular secretions, semen. And also services of room that has had airborne procedures. So airborne procedures include those like CPAP, BiPAP, NG tube suctioning, intubation, ventilation. Also endoscopic procedures are included as the one of the airborne procedures. But the fact that RNA is detected doesn't mean that it's infectious. So there's ongoing research to correlate the detection of RNA and transmission of viruses. The swab test that we commonly do for patients detects the RNA. So patients have a choice of 
doing nose or throat swab or if they really really prefer they can do it rectally as well once you get infected by the virus the incubation period is around four to five days before symptoms onset the viral load peak at five to six days after onset of symptoms and the progression of ARDS typically takes an average of eight to nine days after symptoms onset so the idea is that people can get unwell really quickly therefore they need close monitoring there are still a lot of questions on how long people remain infectious for uh, research has shown that swab tests for RNA can remain positive for up to 42 days but as I mentioned before positive for RNA doesn't mean that the patient remain infectious so currently in the hospital we assume people who had a negative swab test after a positive swab test are not infectious anymore and are able to discharge home in terms of risk factors we know that older people at, are at high risk of uh, serious complications or death from causing from catching coronavirus the table showed hazard ratio of each criteria the higher the ha hazard ratio means higher case fatality rate if they fulfill the criteria so comorbidities such as obesity diabetes cardiovascular disease respiratory and renal diseases cancers are associated with higher case fatality rates Here's another pretty graph that shows that older people and men are at higher risk of death due to COVID. There are less number of cases for younger people, probably because they tend to have milder symptoms and do not require hosp hospital admissions. In terms of symptoms, the most common symptoms are high temperature and new continuous cough. More recently, research has shown that anosmia or agusia are also a very common symptom of COVID. Research has shown that up to 80% of confirmed COVID had one of the two symptoms and in a retrospective survey done in South Korea, 30 of the patients testing positive had anosmia as one of the, as the major presenting symptoms. So other common symptoms include shortness of breath, fatigue, myalgia, GI symptoms, and interesting and confusion as well. I think confusion is more likely uh, in elderly patients because they're more prone to delirium. But I remember there was one patient in the ward um, that was around in the in in the forties and was very confused. He kept asking for repeat chest x-ray and CT scan because he, he, he think he's been healed and went around the ward putting his hand on other people's head and told them that they have also been healed. At the end he settled with the vitamin H. I mean, I mean hello paradox. So in terms of diagnosis, you can take a history examine. So symptoms as mentioned as before signs you would look for hypoxia in abg or saturations on blood tests you typically will see a uh, lymphopenia raised crp deranged clotting and sometimes it's also associated with uh, deranged uh, renal function or um, a raised drop depending on the complication from the COVID. The gold standard is the PCR swap test. So RT-PCR is the swap test that detect RNA. Um, it, it's 70% sensitive. So even with the negative swap test, you can still diagnose COVID um, by clinical findings. Um, the RNA swab test is very dependent on the site and quality of sampling. So in one study, 
of 205 patients. The sensitivity was 93% for bronchoalveolar lavage, 72% for sputum, 63% for nasal swabs, and 32% for throat swabs. The accuracy is also likely to vary depending on the stage of disease and degree of viral multiplication or clearance. Radiologically is very helpful. Chest X-ray typically show bilateral infiltrates more on the peripheries. CT chest will show consolidation, patchy consolidation and ground glass appearance. These will be shown in another lecture in further details and we'll also go through some interesting cases in that lecture. Serology IgG and IgM is the new antibody testing that has started recently in UK. Um, the antibody tests, which is laboratory based, are provided by Roche Diagnostic or Abbott Laboratories. It's it's concluded by the Public Health England that has a specificity of 100%, and the sensitivity for samples that are taken at least 14 days since the onset of symptoms was 93.9% for the Abbott test and 87% of the Roche test. But since the antibody testing has started in Woolwich, there are questions about the sensitivity because quite a few number of uh, doctors who were swap positive came back antibody negative. So whether there's a limited window for antibody testing is is another another ongoing research. In terms of management, it's mostly supportive. Um, we typically give antibiotics that cover for CAP if they're from the community, or HAP if they're from a care home, nursing home, or had recent hospital admissions. That's for the prevention of secondary bacterial infection. We also give oxygen. Um, we in the past we thought that fifteen liters non rebreathe is the maximum oxygen therapy you can give for a mask, uh, other than BiPAP or CPAP. Um, but n now there there have been a new trend of putting people on nineteen liters or twenty two liters, so that's a fifteen liters non rebreathe mask, and plus a nasal spec that runs 4 to 6 litres. Um, there's no clear evidence whether this works, but there has been cases where um, putting people on 19 litres, so 4 litres on the nasal specs on top of the 15 litres normally breathe, improve the PO2 in the ABG. So maybe, maybe it's, it's worth doing it. CPAP, we don't have clear evidence whether that improved the prognosis of uh, people with coronavirus. Um, but if people are for full escalation and have been uh, desaturating or retaining carbon dioxide or with a raised lactate on 15 litres non breathe, then they should be considered for um, intubation and ventilation. Otherwise, they would be for palliation, basically. So there, there are a range of potential treatments that have been suggested for COVID-19, but nobody knows if any of them will turn out to be more in effective. So there's a national uh, trial called the Recovery Trial. It stands for Randomized Evaluation of COVID-19 Therapy and it tests for the uh, list of medications that are given to to people with coronavirus. Um, so that includes some antiviral, steroid, antibiotics, biologics, and convalescent plasma. The one thing that you need to be careful about this is because as an F1, you'll be enrolling these patients into, into the recovery trial, 
but you need to be very careful about the contraindication. So people with liver failure with diabetes are contraindications to some of these medications, so you need to be careful. Currently we don't have a result from, from this trial yet, but hopefully we'll have them soon. In terms of complications, it will be covered in further details in later lectures, but the more common ones are AKI, VTE, and um, cardiovascular. So th there are quite a few people who have PE on top of coronavirus, and AKI is one of the more common ones, and that there's a there's a need of balance of fluids because they are also prone to ARDS, and in ARDS you you must not give fluids, but if it's concurrent with AKI, what do you do? Um, other complications that could cause death are DIC, ARDS, and septic shock, but those are less common than. VT and AKI. In terms of prevention, make sure you wear the appropriate PPE. Hand washing is very important. In terms of PPE, there's, it's divided into PPE for non aerosol generating procedures, which is just glove, apron, surgical mask, and maybe eye protection. Uh, PPE for aerosolizing procedures such as NG tubes, BiPAP, CPAP, intervention, ventilation, suction. Um, you need to put in a full long sleeve gown, surgical gloves, gloves on top of that, a visor and a uh, um, respirator that's at least FFP3 I think. Um, also we are advised to social distance in hospital, but everyone knows that it's it's not possible. We had people telling us off for not social distancing, but in reality, you have a small doctor's or doctor's office with five people in it and not enough computers. So, um, social distancing, do it if you can. One thing that you need to uh, keep in mind is. Once you're exposed to COVID, so if you go into placement or or start to work as an F1, you need to take more care if you live with someone who's high risk of uh, poor prognosis in COVID. Because if you catch it, you can pass it on to them easily if you're in co close contact or live together. And you as young and healthy adults, you probably wouldn't suffer much from it, probably don't need hospital admission, but um, caution need to be taken if you're, you're living with high-risk patients, high-risk people. So that's the end of the uh, lecture, hopefully that was useful and may, hopefully it's interesting as well. Um, please fill in the feedback form that will be really helpful and tune in for the rest of the lectures. Thank you.